Thank you for coming. My name is Greg Bollinger. I'm director of the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sir Harry Proto, who will introduce our speaker. Well, thanks. Uh, I haven't done anything yet. Okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speaker. We've got a beautiful work and something I think is really quite inspiring. Um, born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, 1960. Oh, he's a real youngster. <laughs> Terrible. Um, then went to Caltech, got his BS degree uh, in 1985 and then uh, to Cornell, where he got his uh, MS and PhD in 1985 and 1988. Then went to AT&T, Labs, where I was for a year. Um, and then he left that to, I guess, a private company to develop um, one that was owned by his parents, um, to develop flexible adaptive servo hydraulic technology. Fast. I know I don't know what that is, but anyway, he tells me he tells us that it wasn't a success. Um, he then returned to the field of microscopy, and uh, I think uh, we go on here and develop Palm, which he I think he's going to talk about. In 2006, he went to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Geneva Farm, and set up a group working on this particular technique. He's been awarded several awards, but the, of course the main one last year was the Nobel Prize. I think I would like to say um, something about this prize, because basically it's about the fact that you shouldn't accept anything that anyone tells you. For instance, the Abbe limit, I think, that you can't use a microscope to see anything smaller than the wavelengths of the light you're using. And um, it reminds me of a number of other ones. I mean, Eric she um, Dan Sheckman uh, discovered quasi-crystals, and no one thought those could exist. And in fact, Linus Pauling, even at the end of his life, never accepted that Dan had actually discovered these quasi-crystals, which are basically uh, dodecahedral uh, symmetry. Um, another one is our own case when we discovered C60. Six papers by the major groups in the field said it, it was wrong, can't be done. And the best example I know is uh, Charlie Towns, who developed the laser, and two Nobel Prize winners, uh, I guess, it, um, no, it may have been at Cornell, or anyway, at his university came in to tell him why was he wasting the department's money developing a laser when it's impossible. So the um, lesson to be learned from that is don't listen to Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> <laughs> but listen to this one. <laughs> Eric, come ahead. Thank you. Yeah, that is sound advice, because half the time I don't know what I'm talking about. But, um, so actually, in this first talk for you guys as undergrads, I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of the history of microscopy and how uh, Harold's and my story fits into it at the end. So um, uh, people have been trying to see better for, for well over 400 years. The first real innovation was when uh, a scientist in the Iberian Peninsula found a way of fusing glass, or fusing sand in a way to make clear glass. And with that, they started making what are called reading stones, so the monks in their dim little cells could read the Bible or read the Koran or whatever more easily as their eyesight was fading. Um, this ended up eventually leading to eyeglasses, which was for the wealthy in the 14th century was a big deal. And it was such a big deal that you know there were many spectacle makers, and they all had their own secret tricks, and they were very, very competitive at that time. So the, the origin of the actual microscope is a bit controversial and somewhat lost in antiquity. But um, in, the, in like 1595, Zacharias Janssen, in one story, was trying to make a better reading stone by putting two of them together to see finer and he basically created the, op the compound optical microscope, where two lenses are better than one. 
to magnify. Um, that story may not be true because he was also 10 years old at the time. So uh, some people think that maybe his dad helped him, and some people think they're outright liars. So um, another guy who played with the microscope, it became very popular at the beginning of the 17th century, was one of the best scientists ever, Galileo Galilei. But he wasn't so much interested in looking at bugs and things. He turned it around the other way, and he pre predominantly used two lenses in the form of a telescope. With that, he made many, many discoveries, including these little stars that were moving around Jupiter, which are known now as the Galilean moons. Um, but with that data and other data he had, he became internally convinced in the heliocentric Copernican theory instead of the geocentric theory. Um, he um, was asked by the Pope to shut up about that, and he did for a period of time. Then a new Pope, who was his friend, became in charge and asked him to actually write a book debunking the heliocentric theory. He wrote that book, and um, he did it as an argument between two people. He called the guy in charge of the geocentric one simplicio, which means simpleton in Italian. And he basically used all the arguments the pope was giving. And so he pissed off his only friend, the pope. And he went in front of the Inquisition, and he just missed torture and death and was instead uh, put on house arrest for the rest of his life. So that's what a scientific career gets you in the end. Um, so, um, so things proceeded, but the real advances and the real, I think, when people woke up to the power of the microscope was in the late 17th century, first with Robert Hooke. Hooke was also an interesting character from humble beginnings. Um, he uh, became the surveyor after the Great Fire of London. Um, and around the same time, he became sort of the experimental guru in the new royal society uh, of science in London. And um, there he would do many experiments for all the more illustrious guys. And um, he started dabbling in microscopes, and he was a great illustrator. And so he had this microscope made. And then he wrote a book about all of his observations called Micrographia, which was the first scientific bestseller in history. It was a sensation, in part because in 1666, it was also the Great Plague going through London, and 25% of the population died. The plague is carried by this little guy. So just being able to see this guy kind of at least put some reason behind what is happening. And so uh, Hooke was very famous for that. And so he would take credit for every invention of the era, he was a brilliant man, a polymath. Probably the only guy brighter than him in that era was his contemporary Isaac Newton, who wasn't just the guy running the lab in the Royal Society. He was president of the Royal Society. Newton hated Hooke's guts. And so he basically destroyed every record of Hooke's existence from, from all the paintings, all the lab notebooks, everything that he possibly could get his hands on. And so that's why Hooke doesn't really have the sort of stature that, that Newton has, but he was, he was really amazing in his time, but he wasn't well liked. Um, another contemporary of that time was Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, who um, uh, developed his own form of microscopy. So Hooke had one of these microscopes that had two lenses. Uh, Leeuwenhoek made everybody believe that he was grinding his lenses, but he came up with a new approach in which he would just heat up a piece of glass and pull it like taffy until it was a little thread. And he'd put that thread in a flame, and it would curl up into a little ball that he'd break off. And that little ball lens would sit inside of this little pocket here, and then on the, on the screw would be the sample. And he'd hold that up to the sun and look at it. Because the lens technology of that era really sucked, these ball lenses were by far better than anything else. And Leeuwenhoek was able to see bacteria for the first time. He was able to see dog and human sperm, but we won't ask where he got those samples from. Um, but with all of these things, he made discoveries everywhere. Um, and it was 200 years before microscopes would again be able to see what he could see, because he was a secretive bastard. And he didn't tell anybody his procedure, but instead uh, kept it as a trade secret, so that he'd have basically a monopoly on all these discoveries. So um, microscopes kept going along, but just like the telescope, which is marching along in parallel, they hit this wall in that the lenses would take different colors of light and focus them to different planes, so you get this ugly looking stuff called chromatic aberration. 
The first guy who understood the physics of what was happening there was Newton, in terms of this refraction of light of different colors. And so his solution for the telescope was to get rid of the glass altogether, instead use mirrors and curved mirrors in order to make the telescope. And that solved the chromatic problem for astronomers for a long period of time. But it was difficult to make microscope objectives that way. So marching ahead now into the middle of the 18th century, a guy who was actually a lawyer full time, but dabbled with optics in his in spare time, one of the things that Newton said was it was going to be physically impossible to ever beat this problem of chromatic aberration. But this guy, Chester Moore Hall, didn't believe him and reasoned that if there was another glass of a different way in which it, it uh, bends the light than the first type of glass, you could cement them together in a way where they exactly cancel out their, their aberrations and, and deal with that. That's called an achromatic lens today. So he's the first guy who invented that. Um, he then made some of these, had some of these lenses made since he was just a lawyer. But in order to keep it secret, what he did was he, he subcontracted one of the lenses to one optician and then the other lens to the other optician. Both of those guys, though, subcontracted that to the same damn guy. And so that guy put two and two together and realized what was going on. And then that guy had, this George Bass, had, the, uh, had an understanding of that. And then he told everybody. Okay. One of the guys he told was this John Dolan, who was, who was uh, um, a guy who was uh, an optician and uh, made telescopes for a living. Um, and he started selling these. He patented the idea, even though it wasn't his. He didn't enforce the patent during his lifetime. His son did. And then, uh, and then there was a big patent fight over this. Um, and even though Chester Moore Hall and uh, George Bass were before, his son, they said, well, you weren't the one to actually apply it, so we're giving it to this guy's son. And then basically, that was that. And then, and then when that son died, um, then the price of acromats went down by a factor of two. So um, uh, for microscopy, it was harder to make these lenses. But eventually, this guy, jo Joseph, Joseph Jackson Lister, figured out a way in microscopes to be able to make achromatic lenses, which improved them tremendously. Um, he's actually the father of Baron Lister, who you may know from Listerine. He was one of the early surgeons who learned about anesthetics and so forth, so they're an illustrious family. And then the final problem was something called spherical aberration. Is when you make lenses, it's easy to polish lenses so they're shaped as like part of a sphere. But if you want to make, if you do that, then the light rays don't all converge to one point. And you have to make either crazy A spheres or eventually again, the same trick of cementing together multiple lenses in a way that correct these aberrations. It also allows you to correct for like the piece of glass that you sometimes put over the sample to preserve it with something called a correction collar. And so finally, by the 19th century, they were getting resolution as good as Van Leeuwenhoek had in the 17th century by a compound microscope by making all of these corrections. So then we come up to the late 19th century with this guy, Carl Zeiss, also a guy from Humble Beginnings, who was interested in microscopes. He first started making these single lens microscopes like uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's, but eventually switched to making compound microscopes as that technology improved. And he didn't know anything. He just did it by trial and error and just boop, 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 kept making them better. And pretty soon he was, he was selling like a thousand of these. But the yield, he had a whole factory of guys making them. The yield was very low. And so he would go from workbench to workbench. And if he didn't like what he saw through the thing, he would take a hammer right there and then bing, 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 in front of the workmen and, and destroy the microscope and then go on. That's the kind of guy he was. And so he got so frustrated that these microscopes weren't performing well, he went to the local university in Jena and asked a physicist to help him. So that was this guy, Ernst Abe. And so Abe started thinking about the physics and the, you know, by this time, of course, you know, Maxwell's equations was around. People understood the wave nature of light very well. He started to model what would happen as you go through glass and create a focus. And so we came up with a theory about exactly what type of glasses and what shapes would get you a perfect focus, as, or at least as perfect as his theory would allow. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so he, he worked with Zeiss. They started making these things to Abbe's specifications. 
and they still didn't work as good as they should have. And then eventually they realized that, well, the problem was that, that the glass sucked, okay, and the glass wasn't as good as the theory <coughs> glass. And so uh, Abbe and, and Zeiss took this young guy who had just gotten his, his degree in the chemistry of glass, enticed him to come to Jena, this uh, auto shop. He started making these new types of glasses, doing melting them and mixing them so that they'd be more uniform in the thing. And very quickly, they eventually got thing right down to this theoretical limit that Abbe predicted for how good you can make a microscope. Zeiss died in the late 1880s. Ernst Abbe actually took over the company um, and became very, very, Zeiss was pretty wealthy. Uh, Abbe became obscenely wealthy, but he also was quite a humanitarian. He, he invented the 40-hour work week. He invented paid holidays. All of these things didn't exist before that time. Schott went on not just with the microscopes, but he invented a new type of glass called borosilicate glass, which could heat up and cool down quickly without a cracking. This was the era of gas street lamps. So he sold a crap load of those, and he got wealthier than any of these guys in the end. So, um, so one of the things about Abbe's modeling and theory was that he predicted that because light is in a wave, you could never focus that light down to about half the wavelength of light. And so that you could never ever, no matter what you did in your microscope, make anything that could see smaller than half the wavelength. And so that's known as Abbe's Law, and that's kind of what people believed for about 100 years after he, after he developed that. Well, that's a problem still, because yeah, you can see pretty damn small and see a lot of detail in the cell at Abbe's limit, but if that's the size of a single molecule inside of the cell, then that's the size of the spot that you would see of that molecule at the diffraction limit. So in other words, even the best microscopes, according to Abbe's limit, couldn't see any better than, than 100 times the size of a molecule. And if you want to understand how molecules come together to create a cell in a living thing, it was way too coarse of a tool. And that's where matters stood. So then we skip ahead to the late 20s, where um, quantum mechanics was then in full bloom. And this guy, Louis de Broglie, is a graduate student was able to um, reason based on Bohr's experiments and so forth that electrons aren't just particles, they can also be thought of as waves. And they have a wavelength which is proportional to the mass. And if you run through the math of this, you find out that the wavelength of electrons is orders of magnitude smaller than the wavelength of light. And so within just a few years after that, Ernst Ruska was able to take that idea and by using uh, electrostatics and magnetic fields, be able to focus electrons in the same way you would focus light, but now on a much smaller scale, and made what was the first electron microscope. Even, although he didn't apply that to biology, and nobody did for at least 15 years, today the electron microscope has had a huge role in our understanding at the ultrastructural level what happens in biology. And after 53 years, the Nobel Committee wised up and gave him the Nobel Prize for that. Um, so, so what's the big deal then? We have electron microscopes. Why do we need anything else? Well, obviously, electron microscopes work in a vacuum, and it throws this ionizing high-energy electrons at it. You're not going to look at living things. So you'd still like to find a way of making an optical microscope that would have the resolution of electrons. In addition, there's this problem what's known as contrast. In, a, in an electron microscope, when you put these stains in in order to see the biological structures, it stains a lot of stuff. So it's kind of like having a map of Manhattan. But inside of where many, many things, all the streets are labeled. But you might want to know where are the Starbucks in Manhattan, okay? And the Starbucks would represent, say, a particular type of protein. There are over 10,000 different types of proteins in a cell. So what you want is some way of having just that one protein create contrast and glow. That you can do by something called fluorescence, where you can put a tag on the protein that lights up like a light bulb when you shine it with a laser. And um, a huge innovation, this started to become a big field when I entered graduate school. Fluorescence has been around forever, but its real application microscopy has been since about 1980 onwards. But the real big boom 
was in 1994 when Marty Chalfie was able to snip a little piece of the DNA out of a glowing jellyfish and splice that into the DNA that would represent any protein that you would want in a cell, pump that back into the cell and hijack the cell's machinery so it would produce this protein that's now glowing. That's called green fluorescent protein. And so it's been transformative for biology, and that was awarded the Nobel in 2008. So um, in 1982, that's when the story shifts then to Harold and I. So in 82, I entered graduate school and, and eventually worked for Mike Isaacson and Aaron Lewis. Mike Isaacson was an electron microscopist who had figured out a way of turning the electron microscope around and drill holes in an opaque screen that was much smaller than the wavelength of light. And he and Aaron figured that if you took that screen and pushed it up against the cell, and shined light on one side, the light that would come through the hole would initially be confined to the size of the hole instead of the much bigger wavelength of light. You could then drive that around point by point and make, hopefully, an optical microscope to look at living cells with the resolution of an electron microscope. That sounded really exciting to me compared to any of the other boring condensed matter or magnetic field type stuff that one could have done at Cornell in that era. So, so I said, all right, sign me up, I'll, I'll do that. So um, I worked on that for six years in graduate school at Cornell. I had it kind of working well enough to get my foot in the door at my dream job, which was going to Bell Labs in New Jersey, where I continued to work on the near field approach. The first couple of years were really freaking hard. I was making no progress at all. But I made friends with the guy in the front row, who we'll be talking later today, Harold Hess, who was in my department. And he sort of mentored me through that period. Um, and eventually, I was able to improve the near field stuff in the years three, four, five, and six, where eventually it became reasonably routine. And we were able to do stuff like at one time we had the world record for data storage density, where we were able to write bits as small as 60 nanometers versus the diffraction limit in bits, do lithography, look at tissue sections. And in 1993, I was able, for the first time of anybody, be able by fluorescence to look inside of the cell, in this case looking at what's known as the actin cytoskeleton inside of that cell by near field. So near field became a very hot field in this time. And because of these successes, so many, many people jumped in. Dozens or hundreds of groups were starting to do near field. And I learned one thing about myself is that I really liked the field a lot better when there were just a couple of us as opposed to everybody bumping elbows. And, I, and if you know anything about science, science goes through fads, just like, just like Taylor Swift or whatever crap they're playing on the radio these days. But, but it, 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 it goes up, up, and up, and basically the signal, the real work, remains about the same, but the noise goes through the roof. And so, um, and so people start claiming all sorts of things which are ridiculous. At the same time, it was obvious by this point that Nearfield had lots of problems. And the first one is that the light that comes out of that hole spreads extremely rapidly. So even if you're like about 10 molecules away, then, the, uh, then you get a significant loss of resolution. But a cell is one hell of a lot rougher than that, so it was never going to be good for living cells, which is what I wanted to do. At the same time, um, this was 1994. In 1984, the federal government broke up the monopoly that was the phone company that provided all the money to support us doing the basic research. And it was clear that they weren't going to value basic research in the same way they did before. So we all felt the weight of the world on our shoulders. We also had to work really hard. So Harold was my best friend. Every morning, we would race each other in to be the first guys in the building, get there about 4.30. If he beat me, we'd be the first two cars in the parking lot. And I'd put my hand on the hood and try to tell by the temperature how many minutes he beat me by. And so we were very competitive, but best friends. Um, we then played, we played tennis together every morning after that, and ate dinner together every night, and we worked like hell. So between all of that work and also the fear of what was happening to Bell, it took these young and innocent you guys you see here in 89 and turned us into these bitter and worn out guys <laughs> you see there by 94. So that was reason enough to quit, so I quit. And I didn't have any plan B at all. I was thoroughly sick of academic science and I had wanted nothing to do with it. But I realized on the basis of some experiments that I'll talk about in the next talk with Harold, 
that there might be a different way of beating Abbe's law other than this near field aperture approach. And that's that if your molecule is made of glowing, or if your sample is made of glowing molecules, the problem is, is each molecule creates a fuzzy blob, and those fuzzy blobs run together. But if for they, all those molecules were different from one another, for example, say they glowed in different colors, then if we studied each color individually, we could start to build up a sort of higher dimensional space in which these molecules don't run together, but are actually isolated from one another. If they're isolated from one another, then statistically, you can find the centers of those fuzzy balls to much better precision than the diameter of the fuzzy ball. Just like if I hold up a basketball, you know where the center is to much better than the diameter of that basketball. And so then you can plot to sort of nanometric dimensions where the position of each molecule is. And if you do that, what do you got? You have a molecular resolution image of the sample. So I was unemployed, but I published that idea. Um, the kicker was, the problem was, is that in a biological sample, there might be hundreds of molecules in one focus of the microscope. So you would need like 500 colors or whatever to separate them all out. And I didn't know a good way to do that at the time. So I dropped the idea and ultimately ended up working for my dad's machine tool company in Michigan, where he would make these large customized machines to make things like brake calipers or intake manifolds and so forth. He, the machines they would build would be the width of this auditorium and sell for like $5 million. And I used this sort of old technology called hydraulics. This is the flexible adaptive sort of hydraulic technology. Marry it to energy storage principles that you have in hybrid cars today and modern control technology and collapsed into something about the size of a VW bug. Um, and uh, would save a lot of money. It would move four tons at eight Gs of acceleration and position it to five micron precision. I was very proud of it. I spent four years developing it three years trying to sell it, and in the end I sold two. And so what I learned was that I may be no scientist, but man, I am no businessman. I mean, just hopeless as a businessman. So after burning through about a million dollars of my dad's money, I quit again. And then that was the blackest time in my life, because not only had I pissed away any academic career, I had also blown up my backup plan of following in my dad's footsteps. So, but I did something smart. So in 80, 96 or 97, Harold had left Bell as Bell continued to implode. Went to work for a company that makes test equipment for the disk drive industry. Um, but he was also starting to feel unsatisfied with, with what was going on there. And so uh, basically we were both going through our midlife crises at the same time. So he was in San Diego, I was in Michigan. We would meet in various national parks a few times a year and just start asking, you know, uh, what can we do to make an impact? What's the meaning of life? You know, is there any point to any of it? Blah, 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 right? Okay. And, and starting to think about and what, we, what we realized is that, you know, while we weren't probably cut out for a university and a standard academic science career, we really missed doing science itself. So, um, so I started reading the literature again ran into green fluorescent protein, got excited, decided to come up with a way of making this massively multifocal 3D microscope to look at living cells at high speed, um, and started pitching that idea and trying to get Harold to come in with me. Um, so then in 2005, almost exactly 10 years ago, nine years and 11 months ago, at Harold's urging, he had gone on an earlier trip to meet Greg Bovinger, the head of the Magnet Lab, because the three of us were at Bell at the same time, and Greg was trying to recruit Harold, and on that earlier trip, he had met this guy, Mike Davidson, um, who's at the Magnet Lab. And so um, Harold said, you know, there's this guy who does all sorts of this live cell imaging already. You should talk to him. Maybe you guys can work together on that, on that lattice scope idea. So we came to Tallahassee into the Magnet Lab. And that was the first time I met Mike. So if you guys don't know Mike, he's in the front row here. Mike is an amazing guy who was a microscopist, is a microscopist at the Magnet Lab, was able to use his polarized light microscopes to look at cocktail mixes under the microscope, imprint those on neckties, and sell those and made a crap load of money doing that. Uh, but he didn't stop there. He turned around and made the world's greatest resource for microscopy, which has every piece of information that you want under the sun about microscopes.
expanded that out into the, into the tutorial sites for three of the four major microscope companies. And in doing that, he had to show what microscopes are good for, which is live cell imaging. In that era, that meant fluorescent proteins. So Mike made, with an army of people from Florida State, particularly many undergraduates who were sort of with less than stellar GPAs who he would recruit to his lab, and train them to do the cloning to create one of the world's largest libraries of fluorescent proteins. So when we visited almost 10 years ago, we learned from Mike there weren't just fluorescent proteins, but this new type of fluorescent protein that normally doesn't glow at all when you shine a laser on it, but instead you have to shine a violet laser on it, which would activate it or turn it on. And then you shine a blue laser on it, and then it would green, glow green. And so Harold and I, just when we flew in today, we were reminiscing. We were sitting in the airport in Tallahassee, and it struck us that this was the missing link to make that crazy other idea for super resolution that I had published while unemployed the last time I was unemployed to work. And so the idea is, is that you coax your cell to produce the protein you want with that photoactivated fluorescent protein tag but you turn down that violet light so low that only a few molecules come on at a time. Then they're isolated from one another and you can find their centers and start plotting those this way. So this is conceptually how it goes. If only a couple molecules come on, you can find the center of each one, but if you sum all of those fuzzy blobs, you get back to the diffraction limited image. But you start to build, over time, the super resolution image if you find the centers instead. So again, it's the idea that I had pitched in that paper in 1995, but now with time instead of color being the discriminating dimension. And so we thought this was ridiculously idea easy and many people would pop on it, so we were worried about that. Um, it was going to be too difficult to get VC money or, or a grant, but um, because Harold doesn't burn his bridges as effectively as I do, he was able to save a lot of his equipment when he left Bell, so we pulled that out of the storage shed put about 25,000 each of our own money in it, and then normally we'd build it in the garage like uh, Wozniak and Jobs, but we were able to build it in, in his living room because he wasn't married. And so uh, there was nobody standing in the way of that. But we still had a problem in that we knew zero about biology, we're two physicists. But one of the places I was, I was uh, um, slated to go try to pitch my lattice microscope was the National Institutes of Health, were the inventors, uh, Jennifer Lippincott-Schwartz and George Patterson, of the first of these photoactivated fluorescent proteins was located. So I asked to take them to lunch, took them to lunch, swore them a secrecy, told them Harold's in my idea. Uh, they said, that sounded like a wonderful idea. Why don't you bring your microscope? So we did that. And very quickly, um, with George and Jennifer's help, this is a section through a cell, a thin section looking through these multi-vesicular bodies and turning on the violet light so low that, oop, there we go, I'm moving. Um, maybe if I back up, I'll get it again. Only a few come on at a time, but if you sum them together, you get fraction limited image, and if you just plot the centers, you start to build what's known as PALM, or photoactivated localization microscope image. And after 20,000 frames of doing that, you go from this to this, or to appreciate the resolution gain. So basically, it takes a normal microscope that has about 200 nanometer resolution and can get down to about 10 or 20 nanometer resolution, or 10 to 20 times Abbe's limit, and it's simple enough that you can do in your living room. So many, many people popped onto that idea. Um, fast forward to October, November, December of this year, where um, in the end, they decided to award the Nobel Prize for this, as I'll say in my later talks. I think this is a ridiculously premature prize. I think the field still has a lot to prove, but this is a little bit. All I would say for the young people in the audience is, is this is kind of fun and a fairy tale, but, but in the end, I really feel like a hypocrite for accepting the Nobel, because I've always really believed that, that prizes are toxic to science, and that you know, people pay too much attention to them, and they're sort of a proxy for what you really should evaluate the science itself and not use this as, a, as some metric of, of success. Um, and so uh, um, really I feel like the real prize was Harold and I's excitement getting the idea of working in that living room. That's what I'll remember. This stuff I'll forget. Okay. So um, 
So for reasons I'll also say later, by 2008, I was as sick of Palm as I was of Nearfield in 1994. So pretty much dropped out of it. Tried to develop other new types of microscopes. Harold and I found basically Howard Hughes Medical Institute in 2000 decided to create a freestanding structure modeled in part on Bell Labs. Harold and I love Bell. We were both able to get jobs here and start then applying our physics tools to be able to help biologists. So this is one technology I developed which allows you to non-invasively look at cells in 3D for very long periods of time at very high speed. I also do a project where, again, we steal from astronomers. And this time, one of the problems is that we want to take cell biology away from the cover slip and isolated cells because they didn't evolve that way, but instead look at cells inside of the organism in which they evolved. But the problem is the light rays get scrambled as they go in just as the light from a distant galaxy gets scrambled by the atmosphere. So astronomers figured out a series of solutions to fix that called adaptive optics. This is application of that to a, uh, an embryo of a fish that's about the width of a fingernail long. This is looking in the brain. This is with the adaptive optics on, and that's turning off the adaptive optics. So that's what a normal microscope would see. This is then applying those tricks to get back to that diffraction limit, not even super resolution. And so the goal of my group is to is try to combine all of these technologies ultimately to allow people to understand biology much better than they do now. And so I'll leave it. Oh, do you have anything more to go? No, I guess that's it for right now. And anyway, thank you for your time. <laughs>